Good morning friends, uh, my name is Reverend Mark Coles and I'm based in the Sankey uh, Valley Methodist Circuit. Uh, the Gospel passage I'm thinking about this morning is from John chapter 20 and uh, verses 19 to 31. And I'd like to use in my text, uh, verse 25, where uh, Thomas said, Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Unless I see the scars, the nails in his hands, and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Uh, my theme today is doubts. Uh, doubts about the Christian faith, doubts about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, because after the excitement of Easter Sunday, and in the cool light of day, perhaps we sit down and wonder, like those followers of 2,000 years ago, can it all be true? Now, the disciple Thomas is sadly remembered, I believe, far more for his doubt than his loyalty, his courage, his honesty and his faith. For Thomas, as many people since him, wanted proof for himself that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. For the truth of Christ's resurrection could only be proven if he both saw and touched this risen Jesus, seeing is believing, as it were. You see, Thomas was unable to accept the testimony of the other disciples at face value. They had met in that upper room, locked away with the risen Jesus Christ. But Thomas was not there. And so initially, he was very much uh, unable he wasn't open to receive the good news of the risen Christ. A good news that so many still today are unable to receive themselves. But this, this did not discourage him wholly. For as John's Gospel tells us, he did not get up and leave the disciples, but he remained with them in fellowship and worship. For unlike Thomas, as I said, the un other disciples had met with Jesus and they were undoubtedly, excitedly, enthusiastically praising and worshipping God. They rejoiced in the new and wonderful knowledge of Jesus Christ as risen Saviour and Lord. For not only had they met with Jesus, but he'd given them a mission, a, a gospel commission to go out into the world and, and they had received the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, Thomas had not experienced any of this. And for a whole week, he was left with his doubts, his anxieties and his fears, and he puts up with his friends, whose anxieties, fears and doubts, which had led them to be locked away in that upper room for fear of the Jewish and Roman authorities, well, they were all now gone. Wonderfully replaced by hope, confidence, joy. For these disciples were all smiles and laughter at the amazing realisation of what had happened on Resurrection Day, on what God had done. For Jesus was alive. His death on the cross was not the end but a new beginning. My friends, these disciples now begin to understand the true nature of Christ and his teaching. They begin to take on for them the true mantle of their importance and significance for the world. For all that Christ had told them before his death was now coming to fruition. His words were true. And the peace, that shalom, that Christ shared with those disciples in the upper room was the peace of reconciliation between mankind and God, won through Christ's passion upon the cross, and, and God's blessing poured out upon them, upon his people, in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So in my opinion, Doubting Thomas deserves to be remembered and respected for his faith and not just his doubt. For his doubt had a purpose. Let me say that again. His doubt had a purpose. For as one commentator said, Thomas's doubt was a cry of faith, for he wanted to know the truth. Thomas's doubt was a cry of faith, for he wanted to know the truth. And in light of the miracle that is resurrection, can we blame Thomas for wanting to find out the truth for himself? Yet Thomas did not idolise doubt. He sought the truth and gladly believed when given the reason to do so. For as Miguel de Anamo in his book The Agony of Christianity says, a faith which does not doubt is a dead faith. A faith which does not doubt is a dead faith. And so the importance and the result being for me that because Thomas expressed his doubts, the answers came and they came most wonderfully in the person of the resurrected Jesus Christ. For now, in John's Gospel, we are told that Thomas had the opportunity not only to see and to believe and to touch. Thomas did not take the opportunity. He didn't need it. For when he met with the risen Christ, his eyes and more importantly, his heart and mind were opened up by God's Holy Spirit to the wondrous and awesome reality of Christ's resurrection from the dead. And Thomas exclaims, My Lord and my God. Friends, for Thomas... I believe he had, from that point on, a living faith in Jesus Christ, not a dead one. For his scepticism had vanished, and Thomas had moved from the human relationship between disciple and rabbi into a new one, where he was brought into the very presence of God. To conclude, my friends, as Methodists, as part of the evangelical tradition, we believe the Bible to be the divine revelation of God in and to the world. And, and that we ourselves can have that personal experience and living relationship with God in Jesus Christ that was so central, so fundamental to our founder John Wesley and his life. But does this exclude any room for doubt in a Christian's life? The answer, I believe, is no. No. For if in both a believer's and a non-believer's life, doubt raises questions, and these questions lead to answers, and that these answers are accepted, then surely doubt has done a beneficial work in the questioner's life. And each of us either has or can receive this presence of God for ourselves. As we open up our lives to God. As we are honest about our questions and our doubts. As we learn to see with eyes of faith. Because my testimony, my testimony is that my questions and my doubts have, have, and still do, deepen my own faith. As I search for the answers within scripture, within my tradition of faith, within my own experience and with my own reason, and, and within prayer and worship, fellowship, and within the lives of fellow believers. For as Robert, the author Robert Browning, once said, I show you doubt to prove that faith exists. I show you doubt to prove that faith exists. And we are a people of faith. So finally, my friends, the scriptures and the other church have marked the way for us. 
for they testify to the followers of Jesus, seeing our risen Lord Jesus 500, 500 on one occasion. And God, if we allow him, can help us through our questions and our times of doubt, just as he did with Thomas and has with countless Christians throughout the centuries. For it is as we continue in this journey of life and faith that we see, that we see the risen Lord Jesus Christ in our midst, in the lives of others, and experience him in our own lives. As we say in faith of Christ, my Lord and my God. Praise to Christ our risen Saviour, Lord and friend. Amen. A time of prayer. Father God, we praise you for your care and love, your compassion, peace and purpose for our lives. We praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, offering hope, forgiveness, new life for all people. We thank you for the disciples and the early church, human like us, who knew the joys and sorrows of life and a living faith that knew true hope in you. Father God, we thank you for Thomas, for his honesty to doubt, for his questions, and for the way in which you met with him and for the life of faith that he lived. Father God, when we have doubts, may we draw closer to you. May we know your loving arms surrounding us through the difficult times of our journey of faith. May we know that we are truly loved and forgiven and chosen by you to be the disciples, the friends of Jesus. And so we thank you for the journey of life and our pilgrimage with you. And so we would ask that you inspire us through your word and through the lives of others as we walk each day with you in and by faith. For Father God, we know that your plans for our lives are more than we can ask or imagine. And so we praise you. We give you thanks for all that you are doing and will do in our lives as we put our faith and our trust in you. For we ask this prayer in the name of our risen Saviour, friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, uh, friends, as I leave you, perhaps uh, you'd like to read for yourself the passage I've spoken from uh, today. Uh, again, it's from John chapter 20 and uh, verses 19 to 31. Also, there is a, a great song uh, by Martin Joseph entitled Treasure the Questions. Uh, and I'd really encourage you to listen to it if you're able to. Well, I want to thank you uh, for listening and say that until we meet again, may the blessing and the peace of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and those you love, this day and always. Amen.